Welcome to the Digital Amateur Television Experimenters Night. This is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania. Amateur radio is a worldwide hobby that has many different aspects. Digital television is just one of the many modes and areas that are covered. Maybe you're interested in becoming involved in the DATV Experimenters Nights. Do you realise that you do not have to be a radio amateur or need any ATV equipment to participate anywhere in the world? Also participate in the night by coming up to the Queen's Domain Club Rooms. Yes, right on top of the Queen's Domain in the Heritage Listed Coast Wireless Station. You never know, we might get you in front of the camera or behind doing one of the many roles during the night. We get underway with our program on a Wednesday night from 7.30pm local time. We'll see you soon. This is VK7 OTC. This is um, VK7 uh, OTC, the uh, club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania with our uh, digital amateur television experimenters night. Uh, and we've got our, uh, I suppose you'd call this the April Fools edition, although I'm not sure that we've got too many April Fools jokes as part of this. Um, but this is uh, the working from the shack number two. Uh, that we're uh, we're getting un, uh, underway, um, given the uh, COVID-19 situation, we're uh, using our uh, our um, powers of uh, communication, I suppose you'd say, to uh, communicate with people all over the place, but uh, via various electronic means. And we've got uh, a bit of an experiment tonight uh, that's uh, going to happen, uh, which involves. Uh, involves uh, interviewing a few people via Zoom um, and um, and um, that's uh, we've got Alan online now and we've got Warren online now so uh, so uh, they're uh, they're dialed in which is fantastic um, and uh, what uh, what we're going to focus on tonight is there was a bit of a momentous um, uh, event that happened uh, for many people in Hobart and and probably around the world uh, last week on uh, the 25th of March um, the Aurora Australis which is the Australian Antarctic Division's icebreaker um, came back from its final voyage uh, which was to Macquarie Island uh, came back into Hobart and basically at the end of that voyage uh, that was the final voyage of the Aurora after 31 years as the icebreaker for the um, for the Antarctic Division and so as part of that what I've got tonight is a little bit of a I suppose a little bit of a tribute to the Aurora Australis or the Orange Ruffy as a lot of people call it the big orange boat that's usually uh, moored down on the uh, the Hobart docks so um, just to uh, just to probably set the scene, um, and I've got a few videos at the end of this um, that will show which are um, wonderful Antarctic Australian Antarctic Division videos around um, um, the uh, 
the launching of it. There's a there's a couple of videos of, that include the launch of the uh, the Aurora back in 1989 in Newcastle. It was actually made in Australia, um, and I, I I did a little bit of research on here, and the launch was actually done by Hazel Hawke. Would you believe Bob Hawke's wife? Um, the first winter voyage uh, was to Heard Island in 1990, um, and then in 1992, uh, a bit of a momentous thing, the, uh, the last of the Antarctic Huskies came back uh, home on the Aurora. Um, there were a, a, bit, a few highlights and a few lowlights, I suppose you'd call it. Um, Rex uh, Moncur of Echo 7 mo who I did uh, invite, to, uh, invite to this, but we, we couldn't get him up and going in time. Uh, however, um, but uh, um, remembers the um, there was a uh, a fairly momentous broken drive gear uh, event that happened. Um, there were some fi engine room fires in 1990, and also it um, it actually ran aground uh, at Mawson Station in 2016. So, uh, and it's also been involved in a number of rescues where um, it, it's actually taken on board a whole lot of people off of other boats and uh, and from various. Um, uh, bases in Antarctica, etc. So it, it's fairly um, eventful. 31 years. It's done over 150 voyages uh, and carried over 14,000 expeditioners. So uh, just uh, a huge, huge um, uh, part of of Antarctic exploration in um, in Australia. So what I will do is I'll actually um, unmute everybody. <laughs> And so, um, oh, Alan, <laughs> oh, very good, Alan. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Alan's, uh, Alan's decided to do some chroma keying. <laughs> so what I'll do, <laughs> what I will do is we'll, we'll just go across to, now bear with me here, guys. Um, we'll just go across to... Three. Okay, there we go. Now, if I if I move if I move you guys across to here. <laughs> now, who I have on online is um, Alan Jeffrey VK Seven KAJ, and also Warren uh, Nicholas VK Seven Whiskey November. Both of whom uh, have worked uh, for the Australian Antarctic Division um, uh, and have travelled uh, south. And I'll, I'll get you. Uh, I'll get you each to outline in a minute uh, what, um, how many times, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, uh, and um, actually, how many um, how many voyages on the on the Aurora Australis um, you also uh, have done? So. Um, um, and can I just say, um, I'll, I'll just remind people, uh, what we're doing is actually uh, taking, um, uh, mind people that we, uh, we've got call-ins on repeater two. Uh, we're trialling tonight uh, call-ins on DMR talk group 3807. And also there's the chat channel on the, uh, the YouTube stream, which, uh, hello to Paul, uh, VK7FPCL. I don't know whether Paul's back in uh, back in Australia, but if he is, welcome, uh, and pro probably in quarantine and all of that sort of stuff. Um, um, so uh, we've got a few ways of being able to communicate with us right at the moment. But what I will do? Oh, there we go. Okay, we can see Alan. Hello, Alan. <laughs> My chroma key doesn't work. <laughs> well, we could see. We okay, could. Okay, I'm over. We could ah, and VK7MO is actually listening as well. Um, are you actually uh, on? Um, uh, you're you're watching or listening or what's um, uh, at Rex um, over? No, we'll give him a call. Just hang on. VK7MO, VK7OTC. I don't know how to get Zoom to work, but I think I might have it. 
Uh, Roger, Roger, would you like me to uh, send you the uh, the the link, uh, Rex? Over. Yeah, please do. <laughs> okay, just stand by. Um, I will. Uh, I will um, just send um, Rex the uh, the. No, I don't want to do that. Meetings. I want to send an invitation to Rex. Here we go. So just bear with us, um, and I'll shoot off a, uh, a email to Rex. There we go. Um, that's one of the advantages. So, um, uh, and welcome. Uh, ah, yes, and Paul's just told me, ah, yes, out of isolation in today. Oh, well, welcome to the world, Paul. So good stuff. <laughs> now, what I will, um, I've got a few questions here um, uh, for Alan and uh, and Warren and and potentially um, uh, potentially Rex in here, and I better actually uh, um, just get Zoom up on the screen uh, so that I can I can see when Rex comes in. So um, so. Um, can you outline for us, and um, probably Alan first, and then uh, Warren, um, the uh, how many voyages uh, have you done on the Aurora, Alan? Right, um, counting one, two, three, four, five-ish as marine science voyages, and I've also done a voyage down to Mawson and back from Mawson, but I stayed in the mid, in the middle of that for a year, so it was only as transport. So, yeah, I've spent a bit of time on the ship. Uh, just a little. <laughs> and um, what about you, Warren? Well, <clears throat> um, you can hear me okay, I trust? Uh, well and truly. Fantastic. Um, yeah, well, my first voyage on the Aurora was in... Um, the later part of 1991, um, and I'll just try and uh, um, list them off the top of my head. So uh, it started off with a, a marine science voyage um, that went via Macquarie Island and um, to do an early resupply. Um, we had uh, equipment difficulties and had to return then from Macquarie Island back to Hobart for some repairs and then commence the actual uh, marine science voyage. So that was a CSRO oceanographic voyage, uh, late 91. Um, that same season, I went to Davis, went down on the Aurora, came back on the Aurora. Um, the next year, uh, I went south on uh, a different vessel, the Ice Spirit, as it was called then. Um, came back on the Aurora, though. And that's possibly um, the voyage where... Um, Rex Moncur and I first met each other, but I'll let Rex um, tell that story. Um, um, 93 then, I did an outright marine science voyage. It was a, a biology one, uh, also via Heard, via Macquarie Island, and then a crossover to Heard Island. Um, severely bad weather, um, very rough seas. Uh, took us three weeks to get from Macquarie Island over to Heard Island, and uh, it went into the books as being particularly uh, rough um, um, that even the uh, the captain Russell Russling um, entered uh, a few comments in the official ship's log um, to that effect. It was a long voyage 10 weeks I think it was um, so nearly 3 months and um, that was 93 um, next voyage was then uh, for the summer of 95-96 uh, left from Fremantle, um, and I might elaborate more on that. Um, coming home then very late um, of the 95-96 uh, summer. After that, I had no more um, Antarctic voyages at the Golden Stations. Um, I did a few round trip ones then. Um, uh, the next one was, um, I was uh, a trainee in voyage management. So voyage management trainee, uh, abbreviated as VOMIT, um, <laughs> and then the following summer I was deputy voyage leader, um, 
on a very short voyage out of Fremantle. Um, this is where the Aurora had one of its two, two fires, um, <coughs> engine room fires. Um, so uh, uh, that was a very short one. And um, I think after that, the only other voyage was then um, after going down to uh, her to Macquarie Island uh, in 2010. Um, I went down on the Astrolab, came back on the Aurora, <coughs> basically as comm support. So now I've lost count of that. Um, another interesting voyage in between, and that this would have been during um, um, uh, sort of the early winter of 95, I think, um, P&O and the Antarctic Division did a, um, um, a day trip out of Hobart to test some gear and also um, as a special exercise allow um, um, uh, a, a, sh a small number of um, staff with our families uh, to participate on that voyage. So uh, everybody interested uh, could throw their name in a hat. Um, names were drawn, and uh, of those who were selected, they were allowed to bring, uh, I don't know, um, two or three extra relatives with them. And um, I had uh, volunteered to, um, to do uh, uh, voyage management, if you like. In other words, uh, just help out with um, any um, staging area activities and stuff like that. Okay. And, um, I was then given a ticket for the goodwill, so uh, uh, I was nominated. <laughs> Lo and behold, voyage manager, voyage deputy, no, voyage leader for the day. Yes, that was my official title. Oh, very impressive! Wow, well, <laughs> very impressive. And uh, my mother went on that trip. I think my wife and perhaps her mother as well, um, something like that. So there we go. Um, if anybody counted, uh, there you have it. Fantastic! Thank you, Rob. Well. So, um, I should. Yep, yeah, right, uh, Alan? Yeah, I didn't realize how much detail you wanted there. <laughs> I'd just like to add that um, the ship came on around about the start of 1990, came online, and we had a trial voyage which started on the 5th of April 1990. And uh, I think we were supposed to go out for a couple of weeks and come back before Easter. Right. However, things went wrong. And we actually got back on, uh, I think it was Easter Sunday or Easter Monday. Most of us had been working close to 24 or 26 hour days. And... Um, then the hierarchy decided they'd have a post-voyage meeting at around about 6, 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. the day we got back. Uh, I remember saying something to Rex about that, and uh, they called the meeting off. <laughs> so, but that was the initial trial. That was just around Hobart or the Tassie. Yeah. Then I went on the maiden voyage to Heard Island. It was a mid-winter voyage that went to Heard Island. It started in May and we got back you know, in July. So that was an interesting trip. Okay. That was the maiden voyage. Um, then there was another marine science voyage. And the other one Warren talked about where we went to Macquarie Island and the winch broke. That was called Wose. WOS 91, which officially stood for World Ocean Circulation Experiment 1991, but it was later renamed to Worst Ocean Cruise Ever. <laughs> and most of our marine science voyages had um, catchy sort of names like HIMS, that was Heard Island Marine Science, Fish Og, Fish and Oceanography, but in general we all also came up with alternatives which generally said what we thought of these voyages. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that one, we actually took the ship off charter, I think, at Macquarie Island and brought it back and they had to fix the winch. They flew out a new winch from Denmark, I think, and people to install it. As we came up the Derwent, they were cutting holes in the side of the ship and the deck so that they could get the winch in and out of the appropriate place. Things didn't always go according to plan, but um, 
yeah, it was fun. So I only sailed on it in the first two years we had it, and in that first two years we had it, I was on it for 260 days, which, if you think about it, is close to three quarters of a year in uh, the first bit less than two years we had it. Oh, well, and then I didn't go again until I went it. So there. So, so Alan, that, that's a good segue into what's what's your favourite memory of uh, of the Aurora Australis? <laughs> I'm not an employee anymore. <laughs> um, in the early days, it was really good because we went as special crew, and we basically did whatever we needed and. If we needed to run a winch or deploy something, we used to do it. Later on, as it got tighter and tighter as to having pieces of paper to do things, we weren't allowed to do much at all. The crew had to do everything, which meant if we wanted to deploy something, oh, Rex is connecting, um, we had to go and find an officer and a seam, able seaman or ordinary rating to uh, do what we had been doing in the past. Um, lots of other interesting things. Uh, parties in the captain's cabin were particularly good. Uh, the food was excellent most of the time. Um, and, yeah, just, it was good. It was good fun. Okay. I enjoyed it. And, Warren, what's your, uh, your favourite uh, memory? Well, I have to, I have to uh, um, um, take it from, from uh, take on from Alan there. Um, uh, we had some very good times uh, on, on the ship in the earlier years when um, OHMS was um, uh, not fully developed yet. Uh, we had some massive parties down in the bar, which was which was on sort of like the lowest deck of the ship. I never went um, to the bar. <laughs> yeah, <right>. and um, <laughs> yeah, they. Uh, 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 yeah, you, you didn't need to drink much uh, with the rough sea conditions. Um, <clears throat> uh, the two of them really made for uh, a lot of fun, especially uh, when dancing and being sort of, um, <clears throat> I guess, um, thrown from one side of the dance floor to the other side. <laughs> um, yeah, so <clears throat> I think... Um, yeah, I think in, in hindsight, uh, a little bit of limitation on um, on, on alcohol probably uh, was was very wise. Um, I also, uh, Alan, Alan mentioned uh, the good food, um, and the Aurora always had good food. When I uh, when I uh, joined the Antarctic Division, I was a genius Joey, uh, just caring. Uh, then I started going on the Aurora Stratus, and. Um, I couldn't believe my luck. It was free food as much as you like, and um, and it was great. It was good food. The chefs were were amazing, and um, yes, I've, I uh, certainly then uh, within a few years um, um, uh, ballooned a bit due to the aurora. I'd like to claim. <laughs> one, of, one of my uh, one, one of my also sort of um, favorite or intriguing memories. Um, 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 on, on that Rhodes voyage that Alan also mentioned, this is the uh, the Winchbuster voyage, or the one following that. So um, it was an oceanographic voyage. Um, it was kind of still early-ish in the summer season, so there was still a lot of sea ice. And the idea was to do a transect from Hobart down to the ice edge and back. So uh, that was my first experience. I didn't get to see Antarctica as such, but I saw the ice edge and icebergs and so on. Um, and it was just um, just phenomenal. And, and, and that's, um, it, it, well, that's also a relief when um, yeah when we got out of the rough seas and and got into the uh, into the icy area where it was a lot calmer. But uh, during the transect where we did have the rough seas, um, part of the uh, oceanographic uh, work is uh, um, collecting samples of seawater, and we do this using a device called uh, a CTV, uh, which is a uh, a contraption fairly uh, about the size of a telephone booth that has like uh, 24 or more um, um, bottle type cylinders attached to it with openings at both ends um, which are locked open to start with and this whole contraption is then lowered 
off the side of the ship down to the ocean floor, which can be actually several kilometers. And then as it comes up, um, you, you uh, trigger the bottle so that uh, the openings on the top and bottom of the cylinders um, snap shut uh, and, uh, and collect the seawater at that particular uh, level. And so you can get, um, I think, uh, a selection of 24 um, samples um, throughout the cast, um, profiling the, uh, the depths there, the column of the water. So anyways, um, you'd be on station, this thing would be lowered into station as in um, a fixed location at sea. You'd lower this thing into the water and you'd be uh, put there at that spot for hours on end until it reached the bottom and came back up again. And um, <clears throat> once it did make it back up to the top, um, using a type of a gantry it would be brought back in t uh, into the side of the ship which had a very large door it was uh, a fair bit above um, sea level um, so uh, uh, it would come in through the opening and then be lowered onto the deck floor inside this tiny room and uh, um, the scientists would then go crazy and uh, grab all their samples from all these bottles. And so you'd have numerous oceanographers and, and other people wanting their samples. So there was usually quite a frenzy going on there. Okay. So anyways, uh, we, uh, um, <clears throat> due, to, due to the very rough weather, uh, we actually had to skip the odd uh, station and uh, just go on to the next one. But the ones uh, where it was rough and we did risk um, doing these samples, um, <clears throat> I remember one in particular, the CTD was um, uh, just about to be brought back in via the glass gantry into this little, what we call the CTD room. Scientists were ready, crew were there to manhandle the, uh, the rosette um, as it's being lowered onto, onto the floor. And um, all around us were racks and racks of um, test tubes and things like that, uh, ready to be filled with seawater. Well, the ship, popped a swell from the side, a humongous wave came and just roared into the CTD room, flooding us up to our knees or so, and all these, um, all these test tubes started floating up like that, <laughs> that the water rushed out of the CTD room and they all drifted out to sea. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> they were gone. Um, <clears throat> Oh that was quite a that was quite a frightening experience actually and uh, the following that um, uh, new regulations came in that only a minimum of necessary people would be in that room until um, the side hatch could be closed and it was safe to do work in there and then uh, all the bottoms would be allowed in there but just just clinging on for life and watching all these test tubes floating away out into the open sea was was a sight I'll never forget. <laughs> I have a feeling I was asleep while that happened. Yes, I, I, you, I was you on the other here because I think you and I were doing twelve-hour shifts um, yeah. alternately. Yeah, I was on the other one. So yeah. yeah. So but, um, yeah. So I, I might see whether Rex, because we've got Rex online here. I think he's audio only. Um, Rex, are you? Uh, can you hear us? comes up as muted on my thing. Oh, Rex, you're muted. You might have to unmute yourself. Okay, I've just unmuted you. Still shows muted on my screen. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there is, um, I recall on my screen you had to look at the bottom left corner and there was a camera and a microphone to click on to uh, start each of them. Ah, okay. We've got something there, Rex. Uh, we can try just back to uh, 10 meters. Uh, well, that's, that's a way. Right. You, you, you're very distorted, Rex. Your, your microphone level is very, very, very high. I don't know whether you can back it off a little bit. I don't think I know how to do that. Oh, no, that's better. I'll try 10 meters. No, that's better. That's better. Oh, okay. I'll just speak. Further away from the mic. G'day, Steve. <laughs> yeah, hello, Steve. On two meters. 
Um, so Rex, um, I, I was just asking uh, you, the voyages uh, on the uh, on the Aurora. Um, what what uh, what's your fondest, uh, probably your fondest uh, and uh, least fondest memories of uh, voyages on the Aurora? Lots of fond memories of, you know, uh, the vessel going through the ice and um, uh, just the beauty of Antarctica. Against that, I, I thought I should tell you a little bit more about what was actually worrying me. Uh, first, the, the first thing to note is when we, we tried for a couple of years to get the government to fund a, a replacement ship and the only reason they finally agreed to do it was when Nella Dan went off to the rocks at, at Macquarie Island uh, the end result of that it all had to happen extraordinarily quickly and uh, I was uh, at that stage I was deputy director and uh, the director said uh, Okay, uh, and I, I was actually on the iceberg, and I got off the iceberg, and he said, uh, you're going to Finland to negotiate the contract for the building of this ship. Uh, then, uh, I guess, uh, because everything was done so quickly, the contract negotiations were ridiculous. But uh, when we finally got the vessel going, that the first problem was not so much the gear problem that you mentioned, Justin. Uh, it was, in fact, uh, that was on the iceberg. What, what happened is when Aurora first hit, the, it had done some trials and it, everything worked wonderfully, but when it hit the ice for the first time, the, the problem was it had two engines which were both coupled together to the propeller via rubber couplings to sort of take the shock out of any little differences between the two engines. The two engines were controlled by a uh, computer, but as soon as the propeller hit the ice, the computer decided to react to this and send one engine in the opposite, faster or slower than the other. And immediately the rubber couplings, which Ooh. were meant to take the shock, yes. uh, were torn up into little pieces. So uh, Ouch. I guess that was my first I wasn't on the ship while this was happening, but I was trying to manage the whole situation. Right. Uh, the, the next problem was the one with the winch that Alan mentioned. Uh, and I guess my last real problem was when Ian Ellison had the fire on the ship. And uh, I'd have to say, we were very lucky we didn't lose everybody. Uh, but uh, in between, I did two voyages on Aurora. I loved the ship. And uh, I sort of remember everybody was in love with Nella Dan. And then when Aurora came along, they, they thought it was a very artificial thing and not a nice vessel to be on. But it seems to me now everyone's in love with Aurora. And uh, we'll find out whether they're in love with the replacement. <laughs> in the future <laughs> well um, one I'm of the things yeah <laughs> sorry Alan what, what was it I still liked the Nella Dan that okay. was the first ship I went on in 1980 right okay okay well I, I after this um, I, I do have some um, um, I, I do have some videos of both the transition ship, uh, the MPV Everest. Uh, there's a couple of videos of that, but then also some videos of the uh, of the new ship, uh, the Noyina. Um, so uh, so that's uh, that'll follow uh, follow this discussion. But uh, so so Alan, um, um, what I one of the questions I've got here is it's a little bit about the 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 magic of Antarctica that Rex Rex was just talking about. Um, the first time you ever saw ice, um, 
what what was the the sort of the feeling uh, and where, where, when was it when was it um, and 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 just a, a little bit about sort of the magic of Antarctica and uh, something for the for the viewers to sort of take away oh. <laughs> uh, easy questions yeah the first time was in 1980 when I went down on the Nella Dan for my first winter in 1981 one of five um, when did we see it I forget I think we saw little icebergs first and probably the big part big memory of that is that we saw a particularly big iceberg and for some reason the voyage leader looked at me and said right you're going and what that meant was I had to don my Antarctic gear what I had go to the heli deck hop in a helicopter and fly and land on this iceberg which was very very large indeed and we put a weather station on the top of it and then we flew off and back onto the ship now the this sticks in my mind for several reasons because that was also the very first time i had ever been in a plane of any form so okay. not only what at a plane but I was in Antarctica I landed on a very large lump of ice and yeah that was pretty good and then as we went further south we uh, got into more and more ice and yeah you start to you worry initially I guess and uh, but after a while you get used to the crunching and the banging and the bumping and the grinding noises yep. uh, the Nella was very different to the Aurora in its propulsion system it varied pitch and engine speed the aurora basically only varied engine speed but there was there was a bit of a trick to that it used to run the propeller faster when it went into ice on the i think it was on the theory that if the propeller was rotating faster it crunched the ice quicker right but uh, so they run it faster but with less pitch okay. whereas the nella they adjusted everything but uh yeah, so the crunching through the ice, the penguins, the seals, whales, and then eventually the coast and uh, ice that just went forever. It's what you think it's white, and everybody says, but it's all white down there. No, there's different variations of white and blue, and if you when you get to the Australian stations, there's also the rock there with the brown colour, very similar to this colour, I suspect, in places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. It was in the weather, just working down there, and back in those days, we'd lose radio comms, which was only HF. We'd lose it for a week, and we were entirely on our own for a week. Had no idea what was going in, on in the world. I mean, Corona could have hit, and we wouldn't have known. <laughs> My, not that it would have worried us down there anyway. No. Until no, no. we got out. So, don't know. Okay. I, just liked it. I must have liked it. I did five winters down there, yep. so that's uh, and each one of those was over four hundred days. Wow! The longest being ninety days, um, and then the five marine science voyages. So cool. And it was good. Okay, thank you, Alan. What about uh, you, Warren? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, <clears throat> Um, I guess so. Uh, what was the question again? The, uh, the, the first time you saw us, um, and and then the magic of Antarctica. Well, yes, uh, the first time I saw ice, um, I remember. So that was on that uh, the Rose voyage, um, where we were going to the ice edge, and um, well before we got to the ice edge, uh, the first first iceberg appeared on the horizon and it was just a tiny white dot on the horizon and uh, for a lot of us um, because this was a, um, a science voyage with a lot of CSRO scientists um, um, not many of them had been down south so uh, uh, this was the very first iceberg for many of us on board and hence um, huge excitement all around <clears throat> and um, I remember coming I was 
I think I wanted to grab my camera. I was up on the bridge, saw that iceberg, you know, it was just a speck on the distance. <clears throat> and so I was uh, racing down the stairway to get to my cabin to grab the camera, and I passed one of the um, one of the uh, uh, deckhands, <clears throat> um, Paddy, as uh, as Alan would remember. And uh, I said, oh, there's an iceberg, there's an iceberg. And this guy, he just looked at me with a long face, and he just sort of says, yeah, yeah, there's going to be plenty more than, you know, don't worry about it. And it was such an anti-climax, I thought, oh, gosh. <laughs> Love it. So anyways, um, I think um, we, we pursued on icebergs. Uh, became more frequent and larger, and uh, binoculars came out. We were we were uh, having a look at these icebergs. I, we, we managed to get off the uh, planned uh, um, um, transect as well to uh, yeah. to view some of them a little bit slower. Once we got then in, into the sea ice, um, it's interesting to see how uh, uh, you first encounter a lot of ice flows, and then um, you find. Um, freshly frozen ice which isn't really that solid yet it kind of goes through a greasy phase um, and all these different stages of uh, fresh sea ice until you get into the thicker stuff where you start grinding your way into it and uh, um, one of our um, one of our he was, he was a PhD student then um, um, Tony Warby, who is now a professor in um, uh, glaci uh, either glaciology or oceanography, but uh, he had this monster camera set up off the side of the ship outside the Met Lab, and um, using a, uh, a tape deck recorder, I think, uh, he was recording um, all the uh, ice happenings as it went past the ship as we were sailing into the ice, and um, that was all... Um, um, data for him to uh, uh, to use in um, in writing up his thesis. So um, that voyage, yeah, we got into sea ice, but uh, um, didn't go very far. It wasn't until later that same summer um, when I then uh, went to Davis Station that we went into uh, into crunching ice, and uh, <coughs> um, it, it was fascinating in that. Uh, you put all your uh, your gear on, go out to the front of the ship to where the bow is, and um, try and look over the edge, and uh, just watch the cracks appearing as they split apart, and listen to this rumbling noise that the ship would do. Because at that point there, you wouldn't hear the engine noise or the um, sort of the infrastructure um, vibrations uh, that you uh, normally put up with throughout the, the rest of the uh, the ship. Yep. And um, yeah, it's just um, uh, yeah. I thought this this is a, a one-off experience that um, you know first timers um, really uh, really feel privileged to. But maybe maybe others feel differently. But for me, I think um, every every time. I went back to the Antarctic again, and we repeated the same thing of ice crunching. It was just uh, a wonderful experience yeah. each each and every time. Okay. Um, and um, as we get slower, as we get further and further into the um, uh, towards the coast of Antarctica, and the ice would get thicker, then the crunching got harder to the point where the ship would start ramming. Would have to reverse, pick up speed, ram again. And um, <clears throat> at some point, then um, um, you just couldn't go any further. Um, there would be lookouts um, trying to find gaps in the ice. Uh, satellite images would be used to see whether we could find um, possible passages. And of course, if, um, if helicopters are available, they might do reconnaissance flights too. Um, but um, in this case, we got reasonably close to um, Davis Station, but we're still about um, oh, 50 kilometers off or so. So uh, at this point, then all the expeditioners and uh, cargo that meant to go to a Davis Station had to be then transferred by uh, by helicopter, and um, so that would take its time too. Okay. Um, it's wonderful if um, if you're allowed off the ship onto the ice. 
um, it's not only being able to step on the ice and sort of think, wow, I'm, I'm actually on sea ice, I'm frozen sea ice. What enhances that experience is the fact that you can actually, at long last, step away from the ship, remove yourself physically from the ship, and then you turn around and you finally get to see the ship. Well, like from, you know, from an outsider's perspective, and you can see that beautiful thing that you've been traveling on because up until that point you're just on the ship or in the ship. Yes, so uh, yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's a wonderful experience. Fantastic, thank you, Warren. Um, what about Rex? Um, okay, <laughs> am I got the level about right? Yeah, no, that's good. That's good, Rex. Go. Okay. Uh, look, I I agree entirely with Warren that sort of as you. Every time you go down there and you you go into the ice, it's just a, a, a magic experience. The downside of that experience, from my perspective, is because you've got 24 hours sunlight, you don't want to go to sleep. And after two or three days of watching this wonderful experience, <laughs> you are totally ruined. I was going to say something stronger. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, I, uh, Warren asked me to uh, repeat a little story, and uh, I, I guess I was on the bridge uh, at night, so it must have been late in the season when it was dark, and I was still up there watching, loving every bit of it, and there was another guy on the bridge, other than, like, there's always the, one of the mates and uh, one of the seamen as a lookout and I was uh, I sort of approached him and said oh who do you work for uh, thinking he was one of the scientists and he says uh, I work for you and it's my business card <laughs> and that was Warren <laughs> <laughs> oh very good <laughs> oh very good Mm. But there are a few hundred other people work for the Antarctic Division, so that's my excuse. Well, uh, but it, but Rex, it, it, it probably um, probably what a lot of people don't know who who aren't involved with this is the ship's not owned, um, not actually owned by the Antarctic Division. Um, so it, it might be good to go into the arrangement that the Antarctic Division has with with um, P and O. Um, for the audience yeah uh, historically the end well I guess if you go right back the uh, the Antarctic division did use uh, a Navy LST to go to Heard Island but when it by the time it went to the continent we always hired what were called Dan ships the Kista Dan was the first one and uh, the theory was the Dan ships were fairly small ships uh, that were used in the northern summer to service Greenland and in the winter were available in our summer to service our stations. And effectively, we always leased the vessels from uh, the uh, the Danish owners, uh, Sorensen, I think they were. No, that's Arnie Sorensen. I'm getting mixed up with the captain. Lauritsen. But, oh, Lauritsen. Yeah. Yes, that's right. J. Yeah. 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 Uh, when it came to uh, uh, the uh, uh, Aurora Australis, uh, we, we had a, a small team whose job was to put together a specification that would combine all our requirements as best as we could justify. So it was a dedicated marine uh, science ship as well as a cargo ship and a passenger carrying ship and an icebreaker. And to do all these things efficiently meant it was no good for using at any other time of the season for... Uh, you know, doing anything up north. 
uh, and uh, so we had a contract with P&O and the basic reason for doing that is there's an enormous range of skills that a company like P&O has to run a ship organized captains and crews and maintenance and insurance and uh, ice insurance and, uh, and uh, which didn't have that capability in the division so uh, I think it's always been the right thing to just lease the ve vessel yep. uh, admittedly a vessel that met our requirements yep. uh, or the, the word in 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 the C terms is charter the vessel mm, okay. uh, and uh, so P&O owned the vessel uh, we chartered it from them and uh, as I understand it the P&O came to the conclusion finally that after 31 years in order to keep it uh, up to the C worthy regulations it was going to cost too much to continue to use it Yep. Uh, particularly as the Antarctic Division had uh, gone out and uh, sought the charter of another vessel, the new one. Mm. Uh, now, there's going to be a little gap there because the new one's not actually coming on time. Uh, I don't know whether the new one's going to be used at all next summer, but uh, it's been recently announced that uh, there will be a replacement vessel, which I assume is... Uh, not a marine science vessel, just cargo and passengers. Yeah, um, and I, I, I have a couple of videos of that um, uh, after, at the end of this, um, which came off the uh, the interwebs, um, which show it to be a, 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 a what looked like a very uh, general purpose ship. And I have to say, one that doesn't appear to have too much cargo carrying <laughs> capacity, which is a bit interesting but maybe it's got more that is, is hidden but uh, anyway um, certainly in, in comparison Rex to the the new one which is what 160 meters long and um, is, is huge uh, in uh, in comparison so hmm, anyway yeah I must admit uh, uh, fill in vessels I don't know whether Warren or Alan remember the lady Franklin but Yes. We needed. <laughs> we did need a, a fill-in vessel at one stage, and basically the the way the Lady Franklin worked is uh, it had uh, shipping containers below deck, the sort of things that were fitted out for mine workers, and the uh, the uh, expeditioners had to go down into the hold into a a shipping container. Uh, so not salubrious. But sounds like Alan had that experience. <laughs> Over to Alan. No, I, didn't, I didn't sail on it, but it was like a little city of sea containers down in the holds. Uh, there was accommodate, well, sleeping quarters. There was rec, a containers, yeah, containers for sleeping, containers for recreation, containers for cooking and other things. And it was just like a little city in this hold. It was a very interesting ship crewed by some very interesting people from Newfoundland in Canada. Newfie, okay. Uh, <laughs> it had a back door that used to open up. I think they used to use it in Canada and it didn't work by this time. They used to just back it up and wait for the tide to go out and then they'd lower the uh, stern door yep. and just drive vehicles on and off like a roll on, roll off. Okay. But it was very, very in need of maintenance, I think, read rust. I don't think it would have worked. Um, yeah, I think we only had that for a short time. We've had quite a few ships over the years that, as fill-ins, but uh, yeah. This, as Rex said, the Aurora did a lot of things. It was marine science, it was cargo, it was passenger. So it did a lot of things. It didn't do any of them particularly badly it just sort of did it was more like a Holden Kingswood rather than say a Ferrari or a, a Mack truck or something like that it would do most things was it wasn't designed by a committee um. I don't know it was just short of a hundred meters long yeah uh, I'm just running a few numbers there 
it was just short of 100 metres long. The two engines that you mentioned, somebody mentioned earlier, um, one was a V6, uh, V12 and one was a V16. It usually ran on the V12 and it would do about 12 to 13 knots on that. And if it wanted to go a bit faster or in open water, you could run the second engine, the V16, and run both of them together. And that would take the speed up to about 16 or 17 knots, if you were lucky. Uh, it was mainly the big engine and running them both together was mainly for crunching through ice. Okay. But uh, the interesting thing with the little engine running, the trawl deck, it was a trawler as well, by the way, so it was hmm. fitted out with nets for fishing, trawl, trawler. Um, there was quite a big drop from the trawl deck into the water when it was running on the little engine. But when they started up the second engine and ran both of them to try and get 17 knots, the uh, back of the trawl deck was actually underwater, and that's quite a few feet. It was probably 10, 12 feet lower at the back with all the engines running. Uh, the okay. Warren was talking about dropping things into the ocean. The we used to drop down to about four, four and a half thousand metres, and the CTD used to go down at a metre a second. Whoa. So you can yeah, okay. work out how long that took, four and a half thousand seconds to get to the bottom. Yeah. But it used to come up a bit faster at about two metres a second. We'd often have a camera attached to the CTD, and when it got to the bottom, the camera had a weight on a string and a uh, depth sounder calibrated in feet and we'd just get it down to about whatever the length of the string was and then we'd bounce the thing up and down to take a picture okay and if you think about it we're moving this thing that's down four and a half thousand meters or four thousand meters a couple of feet up and down to trigger the shutter and how high is mount wellington yeah <laughs> that's about a, what, a quarter of that <laughs> Yeah, this piece of wire <laughs> off the side of the ship down to the ocean floor is over three times mm. the height of Mount Wellington. There you go. Yeah, that was fun. And trawl deck, we caught fish. Um, we caught an awful lot of orange roughy once. Right. Off the east coast of Tassie. I don't think they want to talk about that too much. <laughs> it was a mistake. We saw... We saw the grass going, oh, we had a sonar on the net and we saw all this grass on the trace. It just looks like grass or noise on the opening into the, yeah, on the screen. And uh, we tried to pull it up quickly. I wasn't on it actually. And uh, yeah, when they got it up, they hadn't pulled it up quite quick enough. And they had th something like three quarters of a ton of orange roughy or something. This is back in those days. Right. Ice, we got ice fish around Heard Island, um, a lot of rocks when we were bottom trawling. Excellent. Good geology. Yeah. Um, did lots of things. So we found deep coral too. You get coral yep. down at a couple of thousand metres, hmm. which, yeah, interesting. Deep sea stuff. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so, so as a as a sort of a closing question, and I'll, I'll start with you, Alan. Um, are you sad to see her go? Uh, I don't know that I really want to answer this. I could have a problem. Oh, okay. When it when it went out on its last voyage and it went down past here, yep. at Blackman's Bay, it pulled into the bay, and uh, yeah. I felt it. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. still, I still do. Okay. And Warren. It, it affected me. Yeah. Okay. Warren, what about you? Well, I have, I have um, all my memories with the uh, Aurora Great Bond memories, um, and um, maybe perhaps uh, we do this again, and uh, we 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 can. Um, um, <clears throat> let a few more stories lose but uh, yeah as much as I enjoy traveling on the Aurora I have to say I, I don't feel that attached to her and even though I'm not connected with the uh, Antarctic Division or the Antarctic program anymore somehow I feel quite excited about the new vessel that we are going to get one day eventually 
so I've been following its progress uh, in, in, um, <clears throat> in the meantime. So, uh, and I do hope once we do have it here in Hobart that um, at least uh, there'll be an opportunity to tour the ship mm. somehow. Well, and truly. But, um, yeah, no, I think, um, I think the Aurora has, has served us well, but um, um, I know how hard she's also worked, and I think her time has come. And um, even though a lot of people are calling for her to be repurposed or to be bought for um, um, alternative uses, it, I don't think it'll be uh, feasible as um, a, a lot of money will need to be continuously uh, um, spent to, uh, to keep her um, yeah, seaworthy. Yeah, but um, yeah, no, it's, um, I'll always reflect fondly on, on, on the Aurora Sprout. Mm. There's even um, there was even a call I heard for it to become a museum, an Antarctic museum, which I, I thought was an interesting idea. But uh, yeah, a, a lot of uh, a lot of work and a lot of upkeep, um, uh, well and truly. Now, what about what about you, Rex? What's what's your uh, yeah your uh, thoughts? Um, I, I can't say I've got that nostalgia feel for it. Uh, partly, I think. While I was so heavily involved in it for the first 10 years of its life, I've been out of the system for, for the last 20 years. Uh, but uh, it's still, I guess, something that I talk to my grandchildren about and uh, I enjoy uh, explaining things about Antarctica to them and they think I did something useful. Uh, None of the expeditioners do, of course, and particularly Alan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, no, well, that, that's um, any any. I'll, I'll just go around the group again. Any sort of final comments? So I'll, uh, I'll I'll we'll, we'll start with start with you, Rex. Um. Well, I, I think all, all we can say, it is the end of an era, and uh, we can only hope the new vessel uh, is an advance on it. Okay. Alan? Yeah, um, it's served well. I saw the end of the Nella. I've now seen the end of this one. And, yeah, I just hope the next one works well in whatever it role it's destined to do. Fantastic. What about you, Warren? Yeah, well, for me, it was a, a dream come true uh, uh, to uh, uh, um, sail at sea, and um, um, it was something that I had a strong desire for um, well, well before I uh, anticipated um, working, moving and working in, in um, in Tasmania, I had always wondered what uh, life at sea would be like, and um, um, yeah, living and working on a ship for weeks on end at sea was was truly uh, uh, for me actually a wonderful experience, even when it did have its hard times. And um, yeah, I think uh, I am very thankful to the Aurora for uh, providing me that kind of enrichment in life, if you like. Okay, fantastic. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, um, thank you to our contributors, which is uh, uh, Warren, VK7 Whiskey November, uh, Alan, VK7 KAJ, and also uh, Rex, VK7 Mike Oscar, uh, for, uh, for putting, uh, putting their thoughts uh, forward on the, uh, the Aurora Australis, which, uh, which uh, did its last voyage uh, on, um, and, well, came back into Hobart on the 25th of March, so uh, not uh, about a week ago. So, and unfortunately there was, there was a whole lot of, um, um, I read on the, the Antarctic Division uh, website today, there was a whole lot of farewell celebrations that were all planned, and because of um, COVID-19 they all had to be shelved, so um, I don't know whether they're going to try and uh, do them a little bit later when things, uh, when things stabilise, but uh, uh, yeah, it's... Um, I hope I hope they do, um, and uh, um, the uh, the the MPV Everest uh, appears in Hobart at some point, um, uh, and uh, 
Uh, yeah, and eventually the new ship, and the new ship um, it will it will be, um, I suspect, will tower over over the Aurora <laughs> and moored at um, at uh, PW1. So uh, um, we look forward to uh, when that happens. So uh, thank you very much, guys. Um, um, I, I have a few things. Uh, one of which um, one of which uh, Rex will be interested in. Um, <laughs> Um, to uh, to finish okay. finish off with, so uh, I, don't, I don't know whether you want to stay on uh, stay online, and uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll do the last little bit, and then uh, we'll we'll close for the night. You're quite welcome to uh, quite welcome to uh, to stay. So uh, what I might do is now ah ah there we go. Okay, so um. That's um, that's that's our uh, our, our little uh, mini tribute to uh, to the Aurora Australis um, um, for uh, for tonight. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Now a, a bit of an update on um, the project. Uh, our first working from the Shack edition uh, last week. I showed uh, a 600 millimeter Andrews um, 10 gig dish. Uh, that uh, Larry very kindly uh, donated to uh, to the course, and I talked about the connector on the uh, on the feed, the CPR 90G connector, which uh, is a bit of a a bit of a strange connector. Uh, and I said I was uh, working on putting a a coaxial transition on uh, to the top. I have drilled and tapped uh, that flange and put the transition on. So if we um, if we head to here, um, this is, and I actually see what we're looking at. Uh, there we go. Uh, this is the uh, the flange that goes on the dish um, and enables you to actually set the uh, polarization by undoing three screws. And then this is the original flange, the CPR uh, 90G, and then this is the WR90 uh, coax. There's a N-type connector sitting under there, and then there's a SMA adapter on there. So uh, that's a, uh, uh, and there's a there's a um, uh, rubber uh, uh, um, washer in there uh, that seals it all off uh, from the weather. So. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the um, the transition on that uh, on that dish. I've yet to do some things on the mount. Now, um, what I might do is actually get uh, Rex um, to uh, to give us a bit of a description um, on the uh, on the actual feed horn. Uh, where you can see the chaparral um, um, uh, on the the end of this this uh, feed horn here, but there's a little, um, what appears to be a plastic um, cover on the <laughs> on here, and it actually serves a very interesting purpose. Um, and I don't know whether Rex wants to uh, outline the the purpose of it. Okay, can you copy me? Still, yes. Justin? Yep. Yep. No yep. problems. Uh, normally, to focus uh, a dish of this sort of uh, F over D, which is about 0.4, uh, you need a fairly large chaparral feed that for 10 gigs is something like about 3 inches across, and that has a fair bit of blockage. However, if you use a material, a plastic, which has a special dielectric constant, you can actually focus the dish with a much smaller feed and therefore it doesn't block the dish as much. And uh, most of us are using the old chaparral feed with sort of three inch across and, and, a, and I mean it's only probably on a 60 centimetre dish about 0.1 of a dB of blockage. But this one's designed so that it probably only blocks 0.01 of a dB and uh, that's the way they do it. Uh, it. It looks, it sort of feels like silicon rubber 
a little bit harder than silicon rubber, but it must be some sort of material like that which has the right dielectric constant. Uh, now, for information, Justin, I'm also sending you an email which has four pictures of the uh, rele relevant to the raw Australis, and, and one is of the couplings that got ground up when it first hit the ice, which I don't think you can show them to anyone else, but they might be of interest. <laughs> okay, Rex. Um, just, um, just bear with me um, because I will. Uh, I'll bring. Uh, I'll bring the uh, the uh, pictures up. Um, now, hang on. We'll just get. Uh, so you've sent them to my email, have you, Rex? Yes, the same one you sent to me, but. I guess because there's a few megabytes of pictures, it might have taken a little while. I know. In this we've, day and age, when everyone's watching, we've got them. Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, we're probably at peak um, peak time. It's very interesting. Um, the YouTube stream um, uh, has a little uh, stream health on it um, that you can watch. Um, those people who are actually watching. Uh, on the stream and uh, have the chat channel up. There's a little stream health that uh, I have to say it, it's there, there aren't too many times when uh, the uh, the the stream was actually um, uh, uh, green. So <laughs> so um, now uh, let me go to here. So here we go, uh, Rex. Uh, this is the first uh, the. Uh, let me just try that again. This is the first. This is the Nella Dan. Not looking terribly healthy. Yes, this is the Nella Dan on the rocks at Macquarie Island, which w caused the government to finally make a decision and right. agree to us chartering a new ship. Okay. And now, th is that Heard Island in the background? That's exactly right. That's Heard Island in the background. So that's um, what is it? Big 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 Bend? No. What's the Big Big Bend, which is actually Australia's highest mountain? Yes, yes, yes. Um, we haven't actually um, added that one to the uh, the SOTA uh, list, but we've been talking about it. <laughs> uh, I, uh, can I say something to that photo? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Um, that that photo. Um, was taken by one of our gear officers, um, Rick Burberry, <coughs> um, when he uh, was in an inflatable um, uh, ducky uh, off the ship, and he uh, basically snapped that shot, and um, somehow it got taken up by Australia Post and um, featured, uh, let me see, um, I think it was like September... 1990 or so on one of the Australian Antarctic Territory postage stamps. It was a $1.20 stamp. And um, that that is where that picture then, um, um, yeah, became uh, famous. famous. Yeah, well and truly. Well and truly. Um, oh, yeah, this is not good. <laughs> so that would have, oh, yeah, that would have been on my first voyage, perhaps. If that was Heard Island around about yes, 1990, yes, that would be right. Oh, there you go. And these, the, uh, these are the couplings, are they, Rex? That's right. These are the rubber couplings when the computers told both engines to go at a different speed Ouch. to correct for the the bumping through the ice. So, so if if both of those rubber couplings were damaged sufficiently how you wouldn't have had any propulsion is that uh, there was enough propulsion that they're a bit worse now because they had to come all the way back from Australia yeah by the time that photo was taken okay so it, it, it they they did get back uh, but we would have had propulsion at very slow speed because there are thrusters that are designed to position the ship you know for when you're doing CTD and things like that, right. hold it in position. Turn thrusters. Pardon? 
two steerable stern thrusters. Yeah, an interesting <laughs> story about that is yeah. uh, I was being asked about this at Senate Estimates uh, about whether the ship could come back if it's in trouble. And, and I said, oh yes, we, we can bring it back at about two knots using the stern thrusters. Oh, no, no, I actually called them rotatable thrusters because you can rotate them in any direction. And a lady senator thought I was saying something rude. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> so, 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 so you had to explain yourself there, Rex. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, well, we'll have to explain it to Alan sometime. <laughs> <laughs> The two stern thrusters on the rear, they didn't like using them because they dropped down out of the hull so they were depo deployable and if they were down under the hull and they went too fast or they hit ice, they could bend and then they couldn't retract them back up into the hull. And this would cause a problem if they wanted to go fast because it would be the drag there which would cause more damage or if they were in ice it would cause more trouble and of course having a hole in a hull that isn't sealed isn't particularly wonderful a lot of the time. So at one stage they actually did bend it while they were off the coast at Mawson when I was down there, that must have been 1997 and they brought one of the shafts in and got the diesos down there to straighten this shaft so they could put it back in and retract the thruster. Uh, they had a similar one for a steerable sonar up, uh, sonar? Yeah, I guess so, up the front. And if they dropped that down, they were always worried whether or not they'd be able to retract it because being up the front, on an icebreaker, something extending out of the hull is a bit of a liability. Mm, so, okay. yeah, there were a few interesting things. Okay. Um, and the last one here, Rex? Uh, that was just the winch cable. You might have heard Alan talk about the fact that that cable has to go down four kilometres. And uh, the, the problem was uh, when that winch... Uh, didn't wind up properly and failed. We not only lost the CTD, which I think belonged to CSRO and cost about sixty thousand uh, dollars. We had to negotiate whose fault it was and put the ship off higher. And of course, you know, for a ship that was costing, uh, I think in those days, about eighty thousand dollars a day. Uh, these are interesting negotiations. Mm, delicate negotiations. <laughs> yes. yes, that was about a dollar a second, I think. It cost us. Yeah. It, I think it was quite a lot of dollars a minute because occasionally the termination on that cable, the electrical termination had failed. That's what we were basically there for, was to re-terminate this thing when it failed. And whenever it failed and we were re-terminating it, uh, people had come and ask us how long it was going to take because it was costing, I don't know, twenty, forty, sixty thousand dollars an hour. And I got sick of this after a while, as some people may understand. And uh, I just said, it's going to take a lot longer now if you keep coming and asking me. So just let me get on with my job, please. <laughs> so, yeah. The problem with the winch, if you've ever tried winding a garden hose onto a reel and getting it each, uh, or a winch, getting the cable to wrap neatly, it's not so bad if you're not under tension because yeah. it's got, it had a, uh, a guide that just went slowly along like that and wrapped the cable onto the drum yep. at the exact width of the cable. But when it was under a lot of tension, the cable becomes slightly th uh, stretched and thinner. And, it, yeah, the, the uh, laying didn't work quite right and it had 
get itself in a bit of a mess and do damage. So, and I think there was a, another thing, once the cable got to 7,000 metres, which we didn't have, thankfully, virtually no steel cable would support its own weight. You had to then use a tapered cable and then the um, um, threading arrangement would become really complicated. So, yeah, it was an interesting problem. Okay. Fantastic. When the cable came off the end of the winch drum, that was also interesting one day. <laughs> <laughs> and and thank you, Rex, for, uh, for for forwarding on those those pictures. Very much appreciated. Uh, uh, ins inside view. So there you go. <laughs> Very good indeed. So um, now, um, given that we're at uh, an hour and twenty already, um, and I think we could we could continue on. Um, I, I might uh, I might call it uh, call it uh, quits at that. But uh, what I'll just say is, um, what we're going to do is start a series of um, uh, working from the uh, from the shack edition. Uh, number three is going to be um, uh, our very first shack tour, and the first shack tour will be uh, by Richard VK7ZBX, who is going to uh, use the marvels of Zoom to give us a tour of uh, of his shack and also uh, of some of the projects that he's got on the bench. So, um, so what we'll do progressively over the next few uh, few uh, DATV nights in working in the shack series uh, is give a uh, a tour of uh, of the shack, um, and uh, uh, so people can get a bit of an idea about people's shacks, and you can show off your shack and show off the projects that you've uh, got on the bench and uh, all of that sort of stuff. So. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's what we've got planned. And um, VK7ZBX Richard uh, Tricky is on the uh, is up first on the list. So if you uh, if you would like to show off your shack, please uh, shoot me an email, and I'll uh, I'll put you on the schedule, and we can uh, we can do a uh, um, uh, a shack tour uh, with you uh, as part of our DATV night. So uh, so using the uh, the marvels of uh, of Zoom. So. Um, so anyway, um, the, the, our videos tonight um, for our RF viewers, only our RF viewers, will go off streaming in a, in a, a minute. Um, we start with um, some of the Aurora Australis, which are, um, <laughs> oh thank you uh, Alan, yes, uh, uh, you're, uh, Alan's doing uh, chroma keying here. Uh, in his shack. Yeah, chroma key. Chroma key, yeah, there you go. He's, he's looking like the uh, abominable snowman. Um, <laughs> And that's the Aurora. Oh, okay. In the uh, in the background there. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Very good indeed. Plowing its way through ice. Um. So so um, we've got uh, some AAD uh, Aurora Australis videos. We've then got some uh, some videos on uh, the new ship. Um, the the Noya Yina, um, and then there's a couple uh, on the MPV Everest. These are these are quite short, uh, couple minute videos. Um, so you get the um, the the whole uh, the whole time series. Uh, we then go into uh, Amateur Logic episode 140, uh, and I think we probably that'll be about it uh, <laughs> for tonight. Um, so next week, uh, get back underway, uh, shack tours, um, and uh, hope to uh, hope to see you online. Um, and uh, now, who have we got? Uh, so, um, guys, you're uh, you're welcome to uh, to drop off of uh, Zoom if you uh, if you wish, um, and uh, we'll take uh, we'll take callbacks uh, on R two. Uh, via the chat channel uh, and hello to uh, Richard hello to Steve um, and <laughs> yeah, Richard just said best uh, tidy up then hi hi uh, okay and Steve was watching on a 65 inch OLED TV so there you go and in fact I think he may have uh, he may have sent uh, sent something to me hang on um, uh, oh there you go oh my god 65 inches of me yeah uh, now that's a uh, that's uh, that's boasting. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so uh, um, 
so yeah, um, I'll take a listen out on um, on R2, also on um, DMR uh, three eight zero seven. So talk group three eight zero seven, which is the uh, the um, uh, the Tasmanian channel, uh, and also via the chat channel if you want to to make any final comments. So. Uh, 73 and we'll see you uh, next week same time same bat channel same bat time uh, for a uh, for a, a tour of uh, of uh, Richard Shack so uh, 73 have a great week stay safe uh, stay socially and physically distanced and uh, remember wash your hands all that stuff um, and uh, We'll uh, together see this uh, see this thing through in one way, way, shape, form, or another. <laughs> so anyway, 73 guys, and we'll head into our uh, our videos, and I'll take uh, I'll take the callbacks. Okay, yeah. 73. 73. 73. Cheers.